Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Thousands of Somalis flee the cycle of starvation and war. Rights Group condemns draft Saudi anti-terror law. And Jordanian demonstrators denounce U.S. interference in their pro-reform movement. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. Somalia is facing drought, not famine, and the United Nations declaration of famine is politically motivated. This was the Islamic al-Shabaab's movement's position, used to express its rejection of the UN's declaration of famine in two Shabaab-controlled regions. This contradicts statements by leaders of the movement who welcomed the UN declaration the day before yesterday. After sounding the alarm bell on the spread of famine in parts of southern Somalia and in order to face the growing humanitarian crises in Africa and Asia, the United Nations requested additional funding. Its budget for next year is $7.9 billion. Meanwhile, the United Nations World Food Program announced its plan to airlift special aid to children in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. Ahmed Qasim reports. This is Somalia, and these people are not preparing to act in a scene in some film recounting the story of the hardship endured by human beings. These are their real circumstances right now on an Arab land called Somalia. They are gathering what was previously given to them to protect themselves from the unknown. The war against them is long. It is waged by an alliance between poverty, hunger, drought and civil strife. This war rages on amid a slow international response. Some of them have decided to flee, a plan that has had successful results on the humanitarian front. So where should they go? To Ethiopia, the country that demanded tens of millions of dollars to face its own drought and the starvation of hundreds of thousands of its residents. Or to Kenya, the country that hosts the largest refugee camp in the world, a camp that is no longer able to absorb additional people in light of its few resources and the constant stream of refugees. To date, we have received $3.6 to date, we have received $3.6 billion, covering 45% of requirements, with $4.3 billion still needed. Our key concern is that there are persistent imbalances in funding among crises. The image is crystal clear. These scenes of suffering and misery condense the story of hardship. Six out of every 10,000 people here die every day, and one-third of these children suffer from malnutrition. 350,000 people from southern Somalia are enduring the catastrophe of famine. And famine here is an advanced stage of the humanitarian disaster that these people have been enduring for a long time. However, it wasn't until regions in southern Somalia were officially declared as famine-stricken that the international community mobilized to reduce the number of deaths. The UN World Food Program announced its plan to airlift special aid to children in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. According to the organization, the situation in Somalia is extremely critical, and its outcome depends on the international community's ability to offer all aid required by the citizens of the Horn of Africa region, currently enduring the worst drought in two decades. These people are now looking for a refuge that can provide their daily sustenance. They are trying to save the lives of their children with the little they are provided and have to wait long hours to receive the simple necessities of life, food, water, and medicine. Under your lead story, anti-regime protesters in Jordan have demonstrated against what they call American interference in the Arab world. Protests have been held in the capital Amman and several more cities. 
Demonstrators in Amman have torched a U.S. flag. They've rejected what they call the American dictates of reform. The protesters have also chanted slogans against the government, which they describe as corrupt. They've also said they want an end to, quote, the policy of dependency, demanding a new government. The protesters have also condemned what they call the government's oppression against the media. This after nine journalists covering a pro-reform protest were injured by the security forces last Friday. In Oman, security forces have fired tear gas at demonstrators in the northern town of Suhar and made large numbers of arrests. Young protesters marched from the Sheikh Khalifa Mosque after Friday prayers, demanding reforms, better wages and more jobs. They also called for the release of political prisoners. Last month, Omani authorities convicted a number of civilians for having taken part in anti-government rallies during February and March. Protests in Oman back, began rather back in January. Saudi-backed regime forces have attacked protesters in several villages, killing one woman and injuring several other people. This is an anti-regime protest continue around the capital, Manama. An elderly woman was suffocated to death after the regime forces fired tear gas at demonstrators in the village of Banijamra near Manama. Several others have also been injured. Two are reported in critical condition. Bahrainis in several towns and villages around the capital came out to protest against the government after Friday prayers. Demonstrators also voiced their anger at their continuing presence of Saudi Arabian military in the small Persian Gulf Kingdom. Saudi Arabia's troops and armor have been in Bahrain since March to stifle the ongoing revolution. Dozens of people have been killed since, some under torture by Saudi-backed regime's henchmen, and hundreds of people have been abducted or imprisoned by the Manama regime. Now, the U.S. Navy has dismissed reports that it's moving the Fifth Fleet out of its base in Bahrain. The U.S. Navy has denied reports that it's planning to relocate its Bahrain-based Fifth Fleet to a neighboring state due to fears of continued unrest in the Persian Gulf Sheikhdom. In Washington, also, the U.S. officials have denied these reports. Over the past several weeks, Western media has, re has been reporting the U.S. is looking for a new home for the massive fleet amid concerns on instability in Bahrain. Now, there are about 40 vessels and close to 30,000 personnel at the U.S. naval base located a few kilometers from the capital, Manama. The Al Khalifa regime came to power under direct British intervention and has been kept propped up by the U.S. and Britain ever since. Elsewhere, Egyptians have gathered in the capital's Liberation Square for another mass rally to demand an immediate end to military rule. Following the Friday prayers, the protesters came out onto the streets calling for the trial of ousted President Hosni Mubarak and his regime officials. They also urged the new military rulers to put an end to trials of civilians, many of whom were arrested during the 18-day revolution. The demonstrators demanded the trial of police officers accused of killing hundreds of protesters. The protesters are angry with the military rulers for failing to speed up promised political reforms. Now, Egypt's military rulers have changed more than half members of the cabinet in an attempt to appease the people. However, they say, protesters say, that is, the concessions are not enough. Afghan people have clashed with foreign forces in Parvan province to abort a U.S.-led night operation. The confrontation happened in the town of Bagram as foreign soldiers were launching an attack on the residents' homes. Press TV's correspondent Fayez Khorshid has told us more about the incident. The people in Bagram U.S. base have been out outraged by U.S. nighttime raid. The NATO forces want to detain uh, Mirza Shireen, who was also one of the residents of that area. And when local villagers there learned about this nighttime raid, they came out of their houses and wanted to stop NATO forces from detaining that man. And clashes erupted between the foreign troops and local villagers there. We know that a number of villagers have been injured. The, the NATO forces opened fire at them, and the Afghan people there uh, gathered outside the U.S. military base and protested against the presence of 
of foreign troops, and they were chanting slogans against the American and NATO forces here in Afghanistan. They wanted an immediate end to U.S. nighttime raids and mounting civilian deaths here in Afghanistan. أدانت منظمة العفو الدولية بشدة قانونا جديدا ل. Amnesty International strongly condemned the new anti-terror law drafted by the Saudi authorities, which criminalizes legitimate political opposition. The organization said in a statement that the draft law, which was categorized as classified, considers it a crime to question the integrity of the king or the crown prince, a crime, and carries a minimum prison sentence of 10 years. مرتكبها بالسجن لعشر سنوات كحد ندنا. The draft law also allows for detaining a person for one year without a trial and holding suspects for four months in solitary confinement. The organization added that the law narrows the space for legal defense and increases the use of the death penalty. It describes the law as posing a dangerous threat to freedom of speech in the name of preventing terrorism. Meanwhile, Saudi lawyers confirmed that tens of thousands of detainees are being held by the kingdom without legal trials. They consider it a blatant violation of criminal procedures. Controversy rose in Saudi Arabia over arrests without trials after the authorities denied the existence of a detainee named Fadi Saeed who had been held for nine years. In addition, human rights activist Dr. Yusuf Al Ahmed was also arrested. Via the internet, he requested that King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz end the long imprisonment of the detainees. He also demanded the release of women who were arrested for peacefully protesting in front of the Interior Ministry this past June. The women protested over the long imprisonment of their relatives. Ahmed appealed to the king to release 1,200 detainees. Syrian cities witnessed popular protests today, like every Friday since the events began in March. Activists on social networking websites called for a demonstration named the Friday of the Grandsons of Khalid ibn al-Walid. The opposition estimated the number of participants to be at 1.2 million protesters. <laughs> Descriptors and opinions vary on the events in Syria, but one thing is constant, and that is the country's regular date with protests every Friday. It has been ongoing for four months. The Syrian dissidents chose to name today's protest the Friday of the grandsons of Khalid ibn al-Walid. People took to the streets in a number of Syrian cities after Friday prayers. Protests were witnessed in the cities and countryside of Damascus, Homs, Hamma, Dara in the south, Idlib in the north, and Deir Azur in the east, near the border with Iraq. According to images uploaded onto the opposition's websites, the number of participants in Friday's protests is estimated at 1.2 million. Northeastern regions with the majority of Kurdish residents also witnessed massive demonstrations in al Hasaka province. Reuters news agency quoted eyewitnesses, saying that security forces used batons and tear gas to disperse thousands of protesters in the city of al Kamishli, leading to a number of injuries. Agence France Presse quoted human rights activist Abdul Karim al Rahawi, saying that hundreds of protesters demonstrated in the Kurdish towns of Amuda, Derbasiya, and Ras al Ain. It is worth mentioning that the death toll was at a record low and gunfire was limited to Homs, where the regime says armed groups there are taking advantage of the peaceful protests. Demonstrations took place in the neighborhoods of Baba Amer, Al Ghouta, Ashira, and Al Qusur, and Dir Balba, despite the military's massive security operation in the city. This, according to opposition activists. <laughs> In the northwestern town of Idlib, activists said protests took place in the main square of the city and there was gunfire in the town of Kfar Nabil in the countryside of Idlib without causing any casualties. In northern Syria's Aleppo, opposition activists reported that security forces stormed Amina Mosque and arrested a number of worshippers. According to preliminary estimates by human rights activists, 
five people were killed today. The head of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Rami Abdul Rahman, said members of the Syrian army and security forces were heavily deployed in two Damascus neighborhoods of Al Kabun and Rekt al Deeb, where a large number of Kurds reside. In contrast, Syrian military sources denied defections from the army, as reported by some media outlets. It said an attack occurred against a military bus in Homs, which led to the death of army personnel and the injury of others. We open with the ongoing crisis in the nation's health sector on this 110th day of the doctor's strike. Some 200 medical students from across the country today joined the physician's campaign for improved work conditions and staged a demonstration of their own outside Tel Aviv's Ikhalov Hospital. Protesters carried signs accusing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of killing the medical establishment, as well as other placards demanding that Netanyahu wake up and realize the value of life. The students also pledged their support of the nation's medical residents who were issued back-to-work orders by the nation National Labor Court earlier this week. Over 75 percent of the 400 students currently in their sixth year of medical studies signed a petition in which they threatened to not begin their residencies next year if current conditions in the health sector are not sufficiently improved. Meanwhile, the Treasury today issued a statement saying that the Ministry of Finance will demand that the dispute with the doctors be resolved by arbitration. This comes in the wake of reports that the Israel Medical Association plans to retract its support of a draft agreement reached earlier with the Treasury through mediation efforts of the Labor Court. And moving from one protest to another, and dozens of people today demonstrated against the country's soaring housing costs in the capital today, marching from the downtown Sahal Square to the Machina Yehuda outdoor market. Organizers are calling on the public to take part in tomorrow night's mass rally slated to take place at Tel Aviv's Habima Square. Activists attempted to erect a tent in the center of the market, although they were prevented from doing so by local police. Jerusalem-based demonstrators against the housing crisis also announced that on Sunday night, they intend to relocate their protest tents from the center of town to the Rose Garden, opposite of the Knesset, where they hope to create a greater presence during the upcoming final vote of the bill proposed by the National Housing Committee. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat demanded that the protesters dismantle their tent encampment from Sahal Square, which is located near the old city and is considered a popular tourist attraction. Palestinian sources are reporting that imprisoned senior Fatah official Marwan Barghouti has been placed in solitary confinement after the discovery of a cell phone in his Khadarim prison cell in the Sharon region. The Israel Prison Service confirmed those reports and stated that a device was found during a routine search regularly conducted in the cells of security prisoners. Earlier this week, Palestinian newspapers published calls from the 52-year-old Palestinian leader of both the first and second intifadas for a mass march in September of at least one million people from within and outside the West Bank to demonstrate support of the slated United Nations vote on recognition of a Palestinian state. Barghouti was sentenced to serve five life terms in 2004 for committing five murders of Israeli citizens in terror attacks, plus an additional 40 years for attempted murder. He features prominently on all lists of Palestinian security prisoners demanded in a potential exchange deal for abducted IDF soldier Gilad Shalit. In Yemen, anti-regime protesters gathered in Sana'a and 16 squares in other provinces to reaffirm their demand to topple all symbols of the regime. They named today the Friday of Rejection of Collective Punishment. In turn, supporters of the ruling party rallied in al Sabin Square in the capital Sana'a on what they called the Friday of Sit-in to Thank God in support of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. جانب من تدريبات لقوات يمنية خاصة على مكافحة الإرهاب. This is a glimpse of the Yemeni special forces in training to fight terrorism. This training is supported by the United States, which is trying very hard to hunt down members of al-Qaeda in Yemen. Everyone has long heard about this support, and these scenes are repeatedly aired on TV. In turn, the Yemeni authorities, headed by President Ali Abdullah Saleh, have been stressing that al-Qaeda is increasingly dangerous. Therefore, these authorities have gained major support politically, financially, and militarily over the last decade. They also benefited from the claim that Saleh is Washington's best ally in this war. 
وأفادت منه في الإيحاء بأن صالح هو الحليف However, political observers believe that this support did not bring much tangible progress in dealing with the issue. Yesterday, the Yemeni authorities announced to have killed an al-Qaeda leader, Ayad al-Shabwani, and a group of his companions. The authorities have previously made the same announcement at least three times. But this time, tribal groups claimed responsibility for killing Shabwani. Protesters in Taiz are denouncing the deterioration of security in Yemen. In broad daylight, assassination attempts targeted high-level Yemeni opposition leader Mohamed Yadoumi, the head of the high authority of the Yemeni Congregation for Reform, or Al-Isla Party. There is no doubt that this was an operation with a dangerous goal. It aimed at shuffling the cards and pushing the matter onto a non-peaceful path. The protests over the assassination attempt of the opposition leader quickly turned into clashes between the protesters and the police. As usual, the authorities commented on what happened. Of course, they say there was an assassination attempt, but members of the army said that they saw gunfire. We, at the General People's Congress, of course, condemned this operation. The government's official spokesman mocked one of the factions in the popular uprising that announced it would break the political impasse by declaring the formation of a transitional presidential council to avoid the country's total collapse. A woman announced the formation of the transitional council. With all due respect and appreciation for her, we can say that the council has a birth defect. The council was born dead. But the current situation in Yemen is that neither side is willing to back down. What worries and causes fear among Yemen's neighbors and Western allies is that the return of the Yemeni president from the hospital to his country will lead to a new round of clashes between his loyalist forces and his opponents demanding he step down. A state of alert and tension is apparent in the capital, Sana'a, amid a security vacuum and deteriorating living conditions in other parts of the country. Anwar Al-Ansi, BBC. We discussed Syria tonight with Professor Ahmed Asfahani, a supporter of the regime. Do you think the Syrian regime is headed for major change? Not its downfall, but major change. Does it have the courage? Is it in charge of the decision-making? And is it capable of change? It is capable, yes. Is it in charge of the decision-making? I cannot answer that question yet. However, the need for change will determine the issue. There is no other option. The situation in Syria is clear. There is no room for Syria to turn back. It cannot return to the one-party system, nor can it return to the National Progressive Front as a coalition linked to the Ba'ath Party that rules the country. It cannot return to the ruling police state. This has become impossible in Syria. We are now in a transitional phase, moving from the current unacceptable status quo to a system that can gather the support of the widest scale of communities of the Syrian people, regardless of whether they are with the loyalists or with the opposition. In my opinion, this transition is urgently needed. The information I have was not obtained from official sources. As you know, as journalists, we gather information from various sources. They indicate that the Syrian leadership will announce a series of measures that meets most of the demands of the protesters. Not all the demands, but most. They include the call for a multi-party system, political openness, and the dismantling of the police state. Hmm. I believe the most difficult task will be dismantling the police state. It is not possible to eliminate a police state that has been in control for 50 years or 70 years. I'm discussing the police state that came to existence in the 1950s before the Ba'ath Party took power. It was born as a result of military coups, starting with Abdid al-Shishakli and Sami al-Hinawi. It is difficult to dismantle such a police state overnight. It is possible to build a pluralistic country, an open country with freedom of speech, and that will later create a state that is not based on security. Despite your optimism, Professor Ahmed Asfahani, historically speaking, there is no precedent for one ruling party that allowed competition from other parties. Will Syria be able to make unprecedented history? Well, there might not be a precedent in the Arab world, but there are several in Eastern Europe. Yes, but their regimes collapsed. It was not the ruling party that allowed pluralism. These regimes fell first. 
فقدت منظومة يعني هي دعنا يعني كمان ما It was the system that collapsed. Let's not simplify the issue in this manner. The Soviet Union collapsed and was holding the reins of these regimes. So naturally, these regimes collapsed as well. However, I'm referring to factional parties. Dr. Mohammed, you asked whether one party can relinquish power. All the communist parties in Eastern European countries collapsed with these regimes. Yes, they collapsed and became political parties. The parties remain, communist parties still exist. Within two or three years, some of these Eastern European countries held elections. The Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party in Syria is unable to maintain its position as the only ruling party, and it should turn into one of many parties. Is this wishful thinking, Mr. Ahmed, or is it possible? No, no, this is the reality and expected to occur in Syria. There are political scientists who believe that due to this party's ideology and its interests, it is not capable of giving up power in this manner. Or it could cosmetically relinquish power, but not effectively. I disagree with this opinion. I recently met with officials from the Ba'ath Party and regular members of the Ba'ath Party, and I've had contacts with its officials. Dr. Mohammed, you would be surprised to see their level of understanding and recognition that the Ba'ath Party is no longer capable of remaining the only ruling party, and that it should conduct a series of measures to relinquish power. It may not be immediate, it may not happen in two or three months, but they've decided on a series of measures that will transform the party from the only one to one of many. This is what I heard from members of the Ba'ath Party that I've met with recently. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.